Right. Well, we have been studying the book of Genesis. Just a sh- quick show of the hands. How many of you have been reading through Genesis, uh, or at least started? All right. Looks like the, uh, most of us have. Uh, we've said that the story of Genesis is really a, a book of stories. And the stories that we'll find and that you are reading uh, have life in them. And uh, it's God's word to us. And that's why we want to encourage you to be reading the book of Genesis. We said that Genesis is a f- foundational to our faith. It is so important that we understand that, that if, if we believe what Genesis says, we can believe what the rest of the word says uh, from Genesis to Revelation. But if we have doubt, especially in the first few chapters of Genesis, if we, have, if we don't understand or if we, if we have questions about what the, you know, for example, the creation account, and we say, well, I'm not sure that's really how it happened, how could we trust the rest of Scripture? And so our encouragement is to believe God's Word. We understand God's Word is God's authoritative Word to us. And we've said this as well, that if we are, uh, we don't want to just return to the book of Genesis, uh, like many of you have heard people say, let's return to the book of Genesis. We want to move forward with the book of Genesis, and, uh, and we're encouraging you to read it. And, and when you finish reading it, again, uh, not that you've read it when you were, you know, five years old or, you know, ten years old, but when you read it again, we want to encourage you to sign the board that's out in the lobby and just put your signature there. There's names already on there. Just follow suit, grab a, a nice pen, sign your name, and then at the end of the series, we're going to put a piece of glass on that. We're going to hang it up, and just as a memento saying, hey, we did this together. We value God's Word, and we studied the book of Genesis together, and so we want you to do that. The, the Sundays that we've looked at Genesis, we started with creation, and we, we saw that God was the focus of creation. It was God in the beginning. It was God's word to start each day. It was God at the end of the day, so on and so forth. But then the second week, last week, when we looked at what was at the center of creation, what was on God's mind when he was creating all of these things, and what was it that was on God's heart? It was us. It was mankind. And we said last week that we were created to rule over creation. But not only to rule over creation, we are to reflect the image of God. So we considered our value, we considered our contribution uh, to to, uh, society and to, to why we're here. And our prayer was, at the end of our service last week, was, Lord, use me to show the world what you are like. Lord, use me to show the world what you're like. And God's image can be reflected in our personality, we said, our morality, the choices we make, even our sexuality and spirituality. And and so we said, God, help us to grow in this area. Well, today we're going to take part two of the story of Adam and Eve. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, well, if we're going to get through the book of Genesis and it's already been three weeks and we're just going to get to chapter three this week, um, we're going to be in Genesis for like over a year. Is anybody thinking that? Well, don't worry. After today, we're going to move pretty aggressive uh, looking at different stories. And uh, it, I promise it won't. This is a fall series, all right? And uh, even if it did take a year, that would be, uh, that would be fine too, right? right? Anything. Yeah, I know, I know. All right. Well, today I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. And my hope is, is that as we look at the second part of the story of Adam and Eve and really look at the fall and look at what happened, the, the greatest tragedy of all times, when we look at that, that we would find ourselves in this story and be able to relate. And I don't think it's a real stretch to find ourselves in this story, but I don't want you to say, well, that was Adam and Eve and that's not me. I want you to consider your story, your uh, history, what has brought you to this moment, and find yourself in this story. We, in this chapter, we find out, yes, we are sinners. <laughs> we also find out why are we sinners. And, but then we also find a way out of our sin. And that's where we want to focus. By the end, we want to look at the idea of grace and what that means, that we can move forward with God's grace in our lives. But I want to do a little teaching here. And so I want to talk, first of all, about what leads (laughs) to sin. What leads to sin? And so in Genesis chapter 3, let's look at the first six verses there. 
Let me read them. It says this. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 2, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. In verse 5, it says, For God knows when you eat, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining knowledge, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave it to her husband, who was there with her. And someone called me up, or I was, I was making a phone call, and they said, hey, I've been reading Genesis. And just so you know, Pastor, Adam was right there with Eve. And I said, I know that, I know that. <laughs> and, uh, but he was right there with her, and he ate it as well. There is something that happened here that happens not, not only to Adam and Eve, but happens to us. What leads to sin? And I want to look at these verses really carefully. The first thing that happens when we are on a path to sin, to make a mistake, to, uh, to uh, do something that's against God's word, the first thing that creeps in is doubt. Satan always starts with doubt. And he comes to the woman, not even called Eve yet, but he comes to the woman and says, Did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. And what's interesting is that Eve here, she decides to interact with the serpent. Now, some of you may think, well, Eve, she must have been, you know, silly, or she must have let her guard down, or, you know, you know she must not have been very smart to be even talking to the serpent. And as I studied this, and as I understand, Adam and Eve were made, were made in the image of God. Sin had not entered. She, you know, we talk about our, we use maybe a small portion of our brain. Some of the commentators that I was reading, they were saying that it was very likely that Adam and Eve were able to use their full capacity of their brain at that point. And so she was smart, but she interacted with with the, the devil, with the serpent at that point. And the question was for Eve is, would Eve be satisfied with the way that God created things, God's creation, or did she believe that she could do it herself better, that she could gain more knowledge? And you know, the doubt crept in for Eve. The Eve, in her response, she changed two things from what God had said in the previous chapter. And I'm going to look at these just for a second. The first thing, that she left out a key word that you find in chapter 2, verse 16. <coughs> it says that the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But then the word that she left out, if you looked at the previous chapter, verse 16, it says that God commanded to the man, it said that you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. She left out the most important word. There was freedom in the Garden of Eve, Eden. And Eve, at, you know, that would be called Eve, she, the woman said, you know, uh, we're free to eat. But then she added something as well. Very interesting. She says, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. God didn't say that to Adam and Eve. It's certainly not recorded that way. You know what's so interesting? As I reflected on the truth of that, Eve's response not only took away from God's word, but also added to God's word in that moment. And you know what? Satan, he comes in our lives, and he's, he will try to plant seeds of doubt in the same way, taking away from God's word, adding to God's word. He twists God's word and puts doubt in our mind. The things that you might be facing, he may come along and say, is it really that big of a deal what you're considering doing? Aren't, uh, uh, aren't you justified in the way that you think or the way that you're acting? Uh, or if everyone is doing it, then it's okay? And all of these things 
is the question is, will we be satisfied with the way that God created us? Well, Eve obviously wasn't. So the doubt was where Satan started. But then doubt led to deception. If we continue to read, we, there's a bold fla- bold-faced lie. No question about it. Satan just, he's the father of lies. We understand that. But he just pulls out a lie right out of thin air. And he says, you will not surely die. Satan is still lying to us. He's lying to our kids. He's lying to to marriages. He's lying to us. And we have to be aware of that. But he came in with deception. But then he continues. And you know what's worse than a lie? Two lies. No, well, maybe. (laughs) But a half lie. Because listen to what he says. He says, you will not surely die. But then he says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There's a lie there, but there's also some truth there. And Satan is so good at that. And Eve is looking at this. She's being deceived. And she's saying, hey, I'm being cheated here. Or I, you know, I'm being deprived or I'm limited. And I could take it into my own hands. And I'm just wondering how many of us let lies or even half lies creep into our lives, deception, and it tricks us, deception. When we consider our honesty in circumstances in business or at school, I was thinking about this, you know, for students that are here, you know, when you're faced with a test at school and you have an opportunity to cheat does it, you know, the deception is, is that, well, I'm limited in my knowledge. I need to, to, to get ahead. It's worth it. It's worth the risk. And, uh, and, and you may end up looking at your neighbors or you end up looking at, at something else where, where it causes you to cheat. How many of us are, there's questions of integrity, the, the, the deception of that, or the question of purity in our lives, saying, you know, there's a deception that there's something better or there's something, you know, that's dazzling that the, that the enemy is, is uh, putting out in front of us. And deception is really, really uh, important for us to recognize. So there was doubt and then deception. But then there was a desire that started to, to work on, uh, on Eve here. And let, we see that in verse number 6. So let's look at that. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was, first of all, good for food, she said, wow, this is this is really good. This is it's beautiful. It looks pleasing. It looks like it would taste fantastic. And then so it's pleasing to the eye. And so it it wasn't only good for food, but but she's saying, man, this looks great. But then it says that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. She, there was something about it that she understood that it was pleasing. You know, it's interesting. There are pleasures in our world. There are possessions that we can get caught up in. There's maybe power or that idea of knowledge that we could, that, that we could get ahead that, 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 you know, in a circumstance if we're not quite uh, honest or we're not, not quite forthright. Um, there's, you know, the idea that sin is uh, pleasurable for a season that, you know, the, you're, not, you're certainly not considering the, cer- the uh, consequences, but there's things in our lives that if we're not careful, the desire can grow, that doubt and deception grows into desire, and all of a sudden, things that we never have considered before, now we're considering to, to be a part of, or considering to partake in, or whatever the case might be. But then there's the decision. We're, we may be deceived. We may have doubt. The desire might be growing. But then for Eve and for Adam as well, there was a decision to be made. And we see that uh, as we continue to read. It's uh, it, that she also gave, or uh, she took some and then she ate it. She decided to eat. And she also gave some to her husband who was there right with her. And, she, uh, and they ate it together. Desire has grown now. And then there's a choice. Desire grows to a place where they, for whatever reason, they didn't say no. 
Some people would say they couldn't have said no. And some of the people, uh, you know, would say, well, uh, you know, if I was in that circumstance, uh, I, would, uh, I could not have said no I- either. And the fact is, is we all have choices and we're faced with circumstances every week, every day sometimes that we have to choose, you know, what are, what's going to be important to us. And what's great about this is, you know, the fact that Adam was there. Adam was, had doubt. Adam had, was deceived. Adam had a desire as well. And then they both partook together. But the last little piece here is death. The fifth piece is that there, there was death awaiting once they took and ate of the, of the fruit. Now, what's interesting is they, when they ate the fruit, it's almost as if they, you know, they take a bite and they look at each other. And they're like, hey, we didn't die. The, you know, God said you would surely die. We're not dead. You know what's interesting? It didn't happen right away. But there was something that happened at that moment. There was a separation from God. There was a separation. So spiritually, they started to die. Not only spiritually, but physically, they started to die as well. And you know what's interesting, I think, is if you turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the consequences of that first sin, that combination of sin, Adam and Eve choosing to eat, not only affected them and their family, but look at... Romans chapter 5, verse 12, says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and the death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. At that moment, there was something that changed, that from that moment forward, every human being that would live, would be born with a sin nature. There would be, their, their tendency would be to sin. Now some people point at Adam and Eve and say, man, I wish they wouldn't have done that. Uh, and, you know, in hindsight, it's like, okay, you know, and why would God even have allowed that to happen? Well, God wanted us to be able to choose. He wanted a relationship with us. You know, when it comes to this death idea that we die when we sin, there are sins that you may be caught up in or that you are considering that right away aren't going to affect you. No one might know. You say, well, I got away with this or, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's no consequences to, to my actions. But let me just say, it will affect you. It will affect your family. It will affect generations if you don't uh, get your get that sin under control. How could they have said no? I don't know. But I know this, that we have the ability to say no. God says, be pure, be holy, even as I am holy in uh, Second Peter, or in First Peter. And, uh, and so we know that it's possible. And as I was thinking about this, how could we say no to, to the things uh, that Satan will tempt us and deceive us and bring doubt and desire will grow? And um, I found uh, the, a pastor in California, Tom Holliday, and he, he's the one that had these, these five D words. I would have never been that smart to think up those, um, just so you know. But listen to what he said. This is Tom Holliday. He says, the way that we respond to doubt and deception will determine whether or not we will create a desire that provokes a decision that will lead us to death. And I want you to write that down or you know, make a mental note of that or listen to it later online and just let that sink in. Let me read it again. The way we respond to doubt and deception will determine whether or not we will create a desire that provokes a decision that will lead us to death. So the point is for us to consider is what are we going to do with the sin that is presented to us? And uh, I've got a friend that talks about this a lot. He says, we need to move upstream, so to speak. So we don't wait to the moment when, you know, two students are, you know, down at the beach and, and there's opportunity and you say, oh, at that point, lead us not into temptation, Lord. We don't wait to that point. We move it upstream to the point where there's doubt or there's a deception saying, 
well, I need this in my life, or I, you know, I want this relationship, or, or there's a doubt that God could take care of your needs, or that God would love you in that way. Or you put it in, you know, into your circumstances, whether it's relating in business or relating in a marriage situation. We want to move the sin upstream so we can catch it at the, at the uh, doubt stage or the deception stage. And I believe that we could then won't allow that desire to creep in and where we would make the decision which would lead to death. Now, in this story of Adam and Eve, well, it not only talks about what leads to sin, and those five Ds, I think, are uh, just a great look at that. But also, we see Adam and Eve's response to the fact that they did sin. And I want to look at that here for a moment, and then we're going to wrap things up by looking at something that God offered uh, in response to Adam and Eve that is just powerful, that God offers each and every one of us. But our response to sin, we see it in Genesis 3, starting in verse 7. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and, the, and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? Like he didn't know. But they answered, I, I hid, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Again, obviously God knew. But the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Sin leads us to three things that we see here. And you may want to jot these down in the, in the uh, side column of your Bible if you've got a Bible that you take notes in. The first thing is that sin leads to shame. For the first time, for Adam and Eve, it's the first time that they felt self-conscious. And what did they try to do? They tried to cover up. Look at verse 7 there. Verse 7 says, They, uh, they grabbed, uh, they, they sewed li- fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. What about us? How many times have I tried to cover up my sin? How many times have you tried to cover up your sin because we are ashamed? Because of shame in our lives. That's certainly one thing that sin leads to. The second thing is, and we see it in verse 8 there, uh, it says, Then the man and woman, they heard the sound of God as they're walking in the cool, so they hid from God. And God said, Where are you? And they said, We heard you in the garden. We were afraid. The second thing that sin leads to is fear. It causes us to hide. Verse 10, they heard and they were afraid because they were naked and so they, they hid. And how many times again do we cover up, do we hide our sin? The third thing is, is that sin leads many times to blaming or to excuses. And, uh, and we see that in verses 11, 12, and 13. Uh, who told you that you were naked? Uh, and then in verse 12, uh, the man said, the woman. He's pointing the finger at his wife. And uh, the woman you put me, put here with me, she gave it to me. And then she says, the serpent, blaming again. And how many times do we find ourselves in our sin, heaped in sin, and we blame others? for the problems that we have caused. Sin is tricky. It causes us to cover up in shame, to f- have fearful uh, guilt, and to blame others. And the same response is true for many of us today. And we, I would say, you know, let's look at Adam and Eve. Not only did they do these things, but they did, when they were pressed, when God came to them, they admitted it. They admitted that they ate. Both the man and the woman both said, look, I ate it. There was a confession, not denial at that point. Not that they could have ran from God, but they, but they said, look, they may have been blaming, but they both said, 
I ate it. And that led to two different things. The first thing it led to is consequences. And we're not going to take the time to look at these, but in verses 14 through 19, you can read there was consequences for the serpent, there were consequences for the, uh, for the woman, and then consequences for the man, for Adam. And, uh, and in each of those, there, there, there's significance. But I want to focus on the other thing that God provided. Not only did God provide consequences, saying uh, these things are going to be true for, for all women, for all men, and uh, certainly for the serpent. But then uh, he provided something that I had never really seen before. He provided grace in a really powerful way. You say, well, what do you mean by that? And I want to look at this uh, together. When we look at uh, Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 21, it says that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and, and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed, uh, uh, he placed on the east side of the garden a cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And as I was reading, one commentator said, this was God's grace to Adam and to Eve and to each and every one of us. I said, and I said, man, I'd never seen that before. And I said, you're exactly right. They ate it. They said, look, we admit it. We confess. And at that moment, God's grace started to work in their lives. And I want you to get a picture of this. The first thing that he did is he provided garments, skin for them. He put together garments of skin. That means that it was the first animal sacrifice. The shed blood, that's right. And what's interesting is that the animal didn't deserve to die. There's a picture of Jesus here, right at the beginning, that Jesus would be the shed blood, his blood would shed, be shed for us, and we partake in communion today, remembering that sacrifice. But he provided skin for the first time. God gave Adam and Eve an opportunity to come clean. He came and he found them. They both admitted it. He didn't grab all the animals and say, all right, animals, come on around and expose their sin. Instead, he covers them. He, noted, he knew that they, they were now self-conscious, and he provided in a really powerful way with garments of grace is how I would describe it. You know what? God offers the same thing to you and to me, that when we sin, he's not interested in exposing our sin and making a spectacle of, our, of us, but he comes alongside and he offers grace. He offers forgiveness, and that's exactly what he did for Adam and Eve. But then he not only provided garments of grace, he offered protection. You say, well, he kicked him out of the garden Eve, and that, that was a consequence, and certainly it was. But he was saving them from taking from the tree of life because if they would have eaten of that, they would have lived in their sin forever. God spared Adam and Eve a lifetime of sin. And of course, again, another picture of Christ is there. And, uh, and we see that, that Christ would, would become uh, our salvation. And he knew that he had to keep them from the tree of life. God did not want man to live forever in this fallen state. And today, we understand now, Adam and Eve wouldn't have understood it then, but there would be another tree that Jesus died on. And it would be through that tree that we find salvation and that we can come to God. That's grace. He protected them from the tree of life. Really, really powerful. And I, I want to boil that, this idea down of grace and say this, that grace in our lives is God meeting our needs that are caused by our sin. All of sin fallen short of the glory of God. What do we deserve? We deserve death. We deserve destruction. But God's grace comes in and meets us, meets our needs because of the sin 
in our own lives. Not because of the sin of someone else. That would be justice. Not because of the sin of the world system of sin. That would be God's love. But grace is meeting my needs that are caused by my sin. And if we let that settle in and we understand that, we can receive that. I hope you find yourself in this story and you may consider your own life and kind of the path that you're on and the fact that we are sinners and uh, many times we're filled with shame or fear or we'll blame others. Let me just encourage you that in your life, if you know and you are prompted in your heart to do so, it is important that we confess our sins one to another. And I would encourage you to confess your sin before you're caught in your sin. How many know if, with your own kids, for those of us that have kids, if, you're, if your son or daughter comes to you and says, hey, I did this wrong, instead of you finding out that they did something wrong, how many know that it's a little different? It is. And I think the same is true when it, when it comes to dealing with God. Now, certainly when we look at our sin, there are consequences Maybe a lost job or a lost relationship or loss of money or loss of respect. For those students, as I was thinking about this and praying, that those students that you know, contemplate you know, cheating on a test or, or trying to get ahead in, in so, uh, some way, it may be a loss of grade if you come, uh, come out with it. You maybe get benched on, uh, if you're in sports and, you're, and you, you, know, you come out and say, hey, I've been doing this and uh, uh, you know, I just want to be out there. And, and you may lose time in playing. But coming out, confessing, that's when God's grace can come and help us right where we are. I just believe this morning that there are many of us that need God's grace, his garment of grace to cover us his protection of grace to protect us from ourselves even. And our need is to move forward in God's grace. I'm going to ask Mary to come and, and uh, just kind of prepare our hearts as we take a moment to reflect on the story of Adam and Eve and really the second part that Adam and Eve, they fell. And again, I say, why did God even allow that to happen? Well, it all goes back to our free will. That God created us with the opportunity to choose. He didn't want to create angels again that just worship automatic. He certainly didn't want to create robots of some sort that just were mechanical and, and just praised and worshiped. He wanted to create a being in his likeness that would worship him. He also, I think, allowed this to happen, and even the way that it happened, as an example for us. So that we're not caught off guard when there's doubt that creeps in our lives, or deception, or a desire to participate in some sort of sin. And I believe that we can take this story and we can put ourselves in it and say, okay, when I'm doubting or when I'm deceived, what do I do? Do I let that desire grow? Because ultimately, there will be a choice. Am I going to sin or am I going to live according to God's plan? And this morning, you may be here and you're saying, man, I've been living my own plan. I've been like Eve, thinking I could do it better on my own or feeling like the the rules of the Bible are keeping something better. There's something better on the other side if I do sin or if I do get caught up in something. This morning, I believe God wants us to deal with the sin that's in our lives. The sin that so easily entangles us. And what would God want for us to do. I believe God calls us to confess our sins. Now some of you are saying, Pastor, if I confess my sins, I'll lose my job. I would lose my family. I would lose my inheritance. 
or I would lose money, or I would lose whatever, a relationship. Let me just say, in light of eternity, if you lost all of that, but regained your soul, it would be worth it. It's not an accident that you're sitting here this morning. I believe God's calling us all to say, okay, what is it in my life that I need to confess? And I realize it is difficult to confess our sins. It's difficult for me. But when we do, there is a weight that is lifted, a freedom that comes, and a grace that is administered in those moments. It's offered. I want to offer you something that if you're here this morning and you're saying, Pastor, I don't know who to tell. Who would I even mention or divulge my sin to? I just want to say that you had the opportunity. I can be a listening ear for you. Confidential. We could pray together. Now, if there's something illegal going on, you know, I may have to, there's certain um, things that I would have to report. But by and large, if you need someone to share with, could I offer a listening ear? Find someone. Let's make an appointment. Let's talk about the things that you're facing. Because I'm telling you, once you do confess, once it's out, there's a weight that's lifted, and then you can move forward in God's grace, and that's what God wants. There are people here, I'm sure, there's shame that's in your life. There is fear in your life. There's a hiding, and there's certainly blaming, saying, well, if you just knew uh, the way my wife is, or way the circumstances of the market are, or the, the, you know, the way that my teachers, uh, whatever. But you know what? Those are not places we want to live in. We want to be free, don't we? I know I do. So this morning, as we close, I want us to take a hard look. And I want everyone to bow your head and close your eyes this morning. No one looking around. And I realize that in a group this size, and I don't know everyone, obviously, there may be, it may be very possible that you've shown up today and there is sin in your life. Well, the Bible says to confess your sin. And if you confess your sin, he is faithful, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Get a picture of this. There is nothing you have done that will make God love you any less. There's nothing you have done that, that you could do that will make him love you any more either. But he's wanting to forgive. And so this morning, without any you know, uh, divulging of exactly what the sin is, I'm just wondering, if, is there anyone here that in a moment of honesty, just between you and God, would say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me because I need forgiveness in my life. And I want you just to slip up your hand and we'll pray here as we close. Yeah, yeah, who else? Yeah, yeah. A moment of honesty saying, yeah, God, that's me. Help me, Lord. Yeah. You know what's so great? There's some young people raising their hands older folks raising their hands, men, women, leaders in the church, friends, guests. You know, the struggle is common, but God is able to meet us right where we are. And he wants to come down and just to clothe you in a garment of grace. Father, I thank you for this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would cause us to take a hard look at 
our lives to take a look at how are we doing in light of your glory and grace. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to confess our sins. And Lord, as we do, we know a weight will be lifted. And freedom is around the corner. No more shame. No more blaming. No more fear. But just a freedom to be who we are. Lord, minister to us. pray a prayer of benediction over you. Lord, I pray that you would go before us, behind us, and all around us. Lord, as we leave this place, help us to be mindful of your desire for us to turn to you, to be confessing our sin one to another. And Lord, I pray that you would just protect us, protect us, provide the grace that we need, praise. We'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two quick things. First of all, Deb will be here. If you're interested at all in hearing more about Bethany services, uh, we're just going to encourage you just to kind of gather down here in the, in the front here in the next few moments. But also, uh, this next week, you're going to be getting some correspondence from me and from the missions board, uh, uh, two different things. Um, and uh, I just want you to be open to the possibility of uh, joining with us in some small groups. And uh, the letter will explain what we're wanting to do in October and in November as a church body. And uh, just uh, very exciting, uh, some things happening. We'll talk more about that next week. But then the second thing is uh, our missions convention is just around the corner. And uh, just be praying, God, you know, stir in my heart in areas of missions where we can partner with people like Deb and with Bethany Services. We can partner with more missions opportunities. And uh, we know that's God's heart. Amen? Amen. Go in the grace of God. If you need prayer for anything, you're welcome to come. We'll anoint you with oil. Uh, but otherwise, go and uh, enjoy the rest of your